The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. Science is settled. Or is it? These are people that really don't know what they're talking about. What real climate scientists say about the so-called experts. The scientists involved, I think, are twisting the truth. The multi-trillion dollar Green New Deal. It would not have a measurable impact on future temperatures. And the real future of our planet. We don't understand natural causes of climate change. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, in the news. Why did Trump walk out of the meeting with Kim Jong-un? The next thing, is the prime minister of Israel going to be indicted? We've got that story. And uh, what about uh, Cohen? Did he lie about Jay Sekulow? We'll try to clarify that. And, uh, well, it's an interesting program. Lots of news change. today. <laughs> right. yeah. We'll talk about that as well. Well, the breaking point in that Hanoi summit came when Kim Jong-un demanded that the U.S. lift all economic sanctions, but stopped short of promising to get rid of all nukes. Jenna Browder reports from Washington. No deal for President Trump and North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. Still, the White House says the talks were constructive and very good. Sometimes you have to walk. And uh, this was just one of those times. Talks were cut short. Both leaders departed, and this news conference moved up two hours. There'll it was about third. the sanctions. Will we there be a third summit, Mr. President? Basically, uh, they wanted the sanctions lifted in their entirety, and we couldn't do that. The president hoped Kim would commit to scrapping his entire nuclear program and weapons. And earlier in the day, it seemed that was possible. In a rare scene, Kim interacting with American reporters who shouted questions at the two leaders. Kim was asked if he was ready to denuclearize. Through a translator, he said, if I'm not willing to do that, I wouldn't be here right now. That's a good answer. Wow, that might be the best answer you've ever heard. But in the end, the North Koreans wanted too much for too little. The lifting of all sanctions, but no commitment to getting rid of all its nukes. Even without a deal, though, the summit appears to have ended on a positive note. I want to say I have great respect for Chairman Kim, and I have great respect for his country. And going into the summit, President Trump stressed the importance of taking the time to get the right deal. And right now, while there are no talks of a third summit, he says he's hopeful the negotiating teams will meet again soon. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. You remember, Reklovic, the two superpowers were ready to have a major arms reduction deal. And President Ronald Reagan didn't want to give up what was called Star Wars. And he and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik, and Reagan walked out. And it turned out that it was the right decision because it, before long, Glasnost came and the Soviet Union fell. So it was the right move, but it sounds like shades of Reykjavik we're dealing with right now. Well, in other news, a convicted criminal went before Congress Wednesday, and he called the president a racist, a con man, and a cheat. Whew. John Jessup has more. That's right, Pat. Republicans pounced on the testimony of Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, because he's convicted of lying to Congress. Still, Cohen told lawmakers Trump's desire to win would have him work with anyone, but he couldn't confirm Trump colluded with Russia in the 2016 election. CBN's White House correspondent Ben Kennedy has the details. In his prepared statement, which had been leaked in media outlets, Cohen called President Trump a cheat and a con man. Congressional Republicans pounced and focused their questioning on Cohen's credibility, given his conviction for lying to Congress. But the commander-in-chief's former fixer and personal lawyer maintained he will let Americans decide who is telling the truth. I am here under oath to correct the record. Michael Cohen's explosive testimony clearly showed intent to damage his former boss, President Trump. I am ashamed because I know what Mr. Trump is. He is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat. The former fixer accused the commander-in-chief of criminal conduct while in office and disclosed a reimbursement check from then-President Trump Cohen claimed was for hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels. He asked me to pay off an adult film star with whom he had an affair and to lie about it to his wife, which I did. And lying to the first lady 
is one of my biggest regrets. And a major accusation that the president had prior knowledge of the 2016 WikiLeaks email dump that hurt Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Cohen stopped short connecting Trump to Russia collusion. Questions have been raised about whether I know of direct evidence that Mr. Trump or his campaign colluded with Russia. I do not. On Faith Nation, CBN's chief political analyst David Brody said Cohen's remarks contradict emails and phone calls he's received from Cohen over the years. He's brass knuckles. He is the fixer. I've known him for eight years, probably dozens and dozens of emails throughout those times. Uh, I want to read you one that he sent me. This was a quote about Donald Trump when I was asking him about his character. And this is what he said, quote, I believe that Donald Trump might possibly be mentally and emotionally the strongest human being I've ever met. The level of hatred by detractors, media pundits, and others would totally overwhelm and cripple others, not him. His convictions are so steadfast and purposeful that he dismisses the negativity so that he can create positive results for all Americans and deliver on his mantra to make America great again. And so, look, this is Michael Cohen in an email to me on August 28, 2000. It's a Here it is. endorsement. Yeah, in 2017. This was not eight years ago. This was just recently, and now he's singing a different tune because he's going to prison. Republicans pointed to Cohen's own past to punch holes in his testimony. Cohen faces three years in prison after pleading guilty to breaking campaign finance laws and for previously lying to Congress. First announced witness for the 116th Congress is a guy who is going to prison in two months for lying to Congress. Now President Trump fired back from Vietnam. I think having a fake hearing like that and having it in the middle of this very important summit is really a terrible thing. Cohen said he never asked for a pardon from President Trump and would not accept one if offered. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Ben. Pat, explosive testimony, but people on the right and the left both say not much new out of his testimony. I think so, but you know the thing, he, he mentioned uh, Jay Sekulow and uh, that Jay had uh, uh, gotten Trump to uh, tone down some of the rhetoric he was making in some statement. And Jay just, uh, you know, told me over the phone, he also told the New York Times that said that was an absolute lie. So uh, you're looking at somebody who, who I, I know personally, and this was one more example of this man uh, not telling the truth. And David Brody pointed it out. It's not, not a good thing. Well, uh, our friend Bibi Netanyahu is in the crosshairs over in uh, Israel, and let's, let's go back to John for that. That's right, Pat. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu may be slapped with multiple indictments. The Attorney General is expected to make an announcement today whether to proceed on charges related to three ongoing investigations. In the most serious case, Netanyahu is accused of firing the director of Israel's communications ministry in exchange for favorable coverage on a top news site. This comes as Netanyahu is in a political fight facing elections in April. Currently, the polls are so close that if his Likud party loses only a few seats, it could turn the tide of the election against him. Well, for more on this, let's go back over to Pat. Now, this is such an important story, and I wanted to make sure that we got Chris Mitchell in on it. Joining us now from Jerusalem is our Middle East Bureau, Chris Mitchell. Chris, uh, tell me what this means for the, uh, Netanyahu's political future. Well, he's in for the political fight of his life, uh, Pat. I talked to a major pollster not too long ago. He said, uh, the battle is on. And that was when the blue and white party was formed just a few days ago by uh, retired General Benny Gantz and another Israeli politician, Yair Lapid. And right there, they actually had more votes than Netanyahu's Likud party. And it all comes down to the numbers, Pat. At that time, it was 36 to 29 uh, for the blue and white to Likud. Now, if the indictments come out, a recent poll said it would be 44 to 25. And what this does if the indictments do come out, and we're expecting it probably any, any hour today, it will shift the political landscape to the left. And it might be that if the election results, as it is today in the recent polls, uh, Netanyahu would not be able to form a government. And it may be up to the blue and white party uh, and retired General Benny Gantz, who you interviewed uh, a little over t uh, 12 years ago on the, uh, on the Israeli uh, border up That's in right. Lebanon after the 2006 yeah, Second I Lebanon War. I consider Benny a, a good friend. We, we, uh, we, we, he was a brigadier general. He was in charge of the Northern Command. Now he's a, a retired uh, chief of staff. Uh, look, uh, why do the Israelis want to uh, consume their leaders? Well, what goes on in their minds on a thing like this? 
Uh, it's a good question, Pat. And I think a lot of people over here think that Israel has its own version of the deep state. You could look at the left, you could look at the media and the police, or maybe the Justice Department, trying to unseat an elected uh, official right now. Uh, it remains to be seen if Netanyahu doesn't win, if there's any other leader of his stature to be able to, uh, per, you know, be on the world stage. For example, just uh, two days, just yesterday, he was up in Moscow negotiating with Vladimir Putin about uh, the ability of Israel to push back Iran's presence, military presence inside Syria. So uh, it seems to be a coordinated effort, according to some people here, of Israel's deep state trying to undermine uh, Netanyahu. It's really something they've been trying to do for years. We'll see what happens uh, with these possible indictments and what impact it's going to have on the elections uh, on April 9th. Chris, thank you so much. And I'm sad because uh, Bibi's a dear friend. Well, of course, Benny Gantz, I consider a friend, too. It's been a few years, but we traveled together uh, up into that uh, territory. Uh, we, we each were flying helicopters, and we went down to the Hula Valley, and we had some uh, interesting times together. So uh, Benny's a good guy, uh, but uh, I, I don't understand. I, I, I'm a close friend of uh, Bibi Netanyahu. I, I met him years after his brother uh, was killed in that uh, Entebbe raid, and uh, uh, you know he was a war hero, and, and uh, Bibi was then studying in the United States. But in any event, uh, I'm saddened to see this so-called deep state trying to take out uh, important figures in the government. Well, let's talk about climate change. Is it a fraud or is it for real, Terry? Well, coming up, one of the so-called climate deniers speaks out. What's ironic is that those of us who are skeptical and outspoken about climate change, for instance, myself, John Christie, uh, MIT, Dick Lindzen, we are more credentialed than most of the alarmists you will find in the media being quoted today. Hear the real deal behind the hype from one of America's top climate scientists. It's coming up after this. It's astounding. California's Sierra Nevada mountains have gotten 25 feet of snow this month alone. 25 feet. And the locals are going to February buried. <laughs> well, they're buried all right. And all across the nation, we're also having one of the coldest, snowiest winters ever. Yet climate change advocates continue to sound the alarm of Coming destruction of global warming. But as Dale Hurd reports, one of America's top climate scientists says it's all a waste of time and money. A new book predicts 100 million climate refugees by 2050. Disagree and you're labeled a climate denier because we're told the science is settled. This Sunday, the climate crisis. The science is settled. When NBC's Meet the Press did a special on climate change recently, skeptics were kept off the program. We're not going to give time to climate deniers. The science is settled, even if political opinion is not. But the science of climate change is only settled for those who believe the climate models, or those scientists afraid of losing research dollars by denying it's a problem. Several of America's top climate scientists, like Dr. Roy Spencer, say it's not settled at all. This is the holy grail of climate research, right there. That's the net feedback parameter, which determines climate sensitivity, which determines whether global warming is going to kill us or make us more prosperous. Before becoming a principal research scientist at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, Dr. Spencer was a senior scientist for climate studies at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. What's ironic is that those of us who are skeptical and outspoken about climate change, for instance, myself, John Christie, uh, MIT, Dick Lindzen, we are more credentialed than most of the alarmists you will find in the media being quoted today. A lot of those people have degrees in geography, or they don't have any kind of science degree at all. These are people that really don't know what they're talking about. We are the credentialed ones. They are not. Spencer agrees the Earth has warmed and that carbon dioxide warms the atmosphere. But there are still too many possible causes for the Earth's warming. 
Is it from deep ocean circulation, or is it simply a rebound from the period known as Little Ice Age? We don't understand natural causes of climate change. Since we don't understand them, we can't put them in a climate model. It's entirely possible there are cyclical changes probably related to deep ocean circulation that are causing these things, but we don't know. We're told in the media that climate change has made weather more severe, even though statistics say otherwise. The number of large tornadoes has gone down dramatically since the 1950s. Hurricane activity in the U.S. is still at a historic low. In the U.S., we went for almost 12 years without a major hurricane strike in the United States, starting after 2005. Now, that was something that a NASA scientist had calculated is about a 1 in 250 year event. In fact, some of the worst hurricane activity in the eastern United States was long before the widespread use of fossil fuels. The Atlantic coast of the United States was reformed by monster hurricanes that struck between the 1600s and the 1800s, long before so-called greenhouse gases or SUVs. This piece of land at the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay is geographic testimony to the great hurricanes hundreds of years ago. Willoughby Spit was created by those hurricanes, 800 acres of sand, more than a square mile. Today, people blame cars for changing the weather. They used to blame witches. Records show that during Little Ice Age, beginning in the 1500s, a lot of people in Europe were executed for the charge of using witchcraft to change the weather. We had crop failures, shorter growing seasons, and it's recorded that hundreds of thousands of people were executed in Europe for the crime of witchcraft. People literally thought their neighbor was causing the shorter growing seasons. Today we have computer models that say your neighbor's SUV is, is uh, affecting the storms and the climates. French philosopher Pascal Bruckner has written that the climate change movement resembles a pagan religion that pushes an apocalyptic narrative. Because it uses all the elements of traditional religion, especially the, the, the theme of the apocalypse. In pushing her multi-trillion dollar Green New Deal, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says the world only has 12 years to prevent the worst effects of climate change. Spencer says government policy will change nothing. You could get rid of the United States entirely. It would not have a measurable impact on future temperatures by the end of this century. Meanwhile, the big loser is science which has been corrupted by a system in which Spencer says grant money is largely only given to scientists who believe in man-made climate change. Science is definitely being damaged when we talk about climate science because the scientists involved, I think, are twisting the truth. And Spencer wonders what will happen when skeptics such as himself eventually pass from the scene, while an entire generation of young people is being raised to believe that the Earth faces doomsday. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Very uh, appealing. The, the only credentialed people in this field are those that we've been interviewing, and the AOC, who is uh, uh, apparently, you know, kidnapped the Democrat Party. Well, was she was a cocktail waitress? Was that? I believe so. Mm -hmm. She's a mixologist. Yeah. That, 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 that's her. That's her. And she wants to completely. In ten years, we've got before the waters rise and the ice melts, and we're in. I mean, it's ridiculous. And she wants to spend seventy-five trillion dollars. The, the amount of money is so staggering you can't even imagine it. And she would destroy, and those people would destroy the earth we live on, and and the. Uh, economies of our great nation. And the amazing thing is that those senior Democrats are lining up behind this kid who has no training at all in this matter, but they're accepting her as the oracle of the, the new age. It's just extraordinary. Terry, I'm, I'm shocked, but the Democrats are, you know, it's, it's like the Pied Piper. He's leading them into the... Well, they've wilderness. been singing this song for a long time. And, you know, Mr. Gore years ago, of course, was one of the... An inconvenient... Soloists on uh, it. Inconvenient... Yeah, but yeah. so it'll be fascinating. But you'd like to think that we were smarter than this, that we'd like to see some proof of what's going on. And 
that all sides would be heard. You know, when you look at the, the climate, for example, if Mars is getting hotter or something like that, they don't have any F SUVs on Mars or Venus or Jupiter, some of those things. But uh, sunspot activity, for example, has changed dramatically. And who knows about uh, La Nina and El Nino out in the, in the ocean. Um, these are the real drivers of our climate. Terry? Well, up next, a nurse rushes to the scene of her own daughter's accident. I could feel that the left side of her head was just soft. It was enlarged. The blood was all over the right side of her face. I knew as a nurse that those were fatal wounds. Stay tuned to see the call to prayer heard round the world and the amazing story of Caroline's miracle. Leslie Massey is a registered nurse, and when she received the call that her daughter had been in an accident, she rushed to the scene. What she found when she got there was horrendous. In September of 2016, Caroline Massey and her best friend Casey were enjoying a ride on Caroline's four-wheeler. A car was approaching from behind, so Casey tried to turn left to get out of the way. They missed the road and hit a utility pole. Caroline was on the ground, bleeding profusely. Casey immediately called her mother, who was with Caroline's mother. All we could hear was her saying, we've crashed, we've crashed. And they had crashed into the woods about a quarter of a mile down from our home. It was the most horrendous feeling I've ever felt. The parents of both girls drove to the scene of the accident. Casey was waiting for them. She was right there flagging us down. And the first thing she said was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I knew from the get-go, something wasn't good. Leslie, a registered nurse, ran to her daughter's side. I could feel that the left side of her head was just soft. It was enlarged. The blood was all over the right side of her face. I knew as a nurse that those were fatal wounds, that she had some fatal wounds. They called 911 immediately. As the ambulance was driving in, prayers were already going up. You could hear Casey in the background praying as loud as she could pray. She, that's all I could hear was that and blocked everything else out and just, you know, attended to Caroline. As Caroline was loaded into the ambulance and taken to a medical airlift, the families continued to pray. We just started praying, dear Lord, you are the great physician. You're going to have to take this. There's nothing we can do. But we know that you can. And we know that whatever your will is, you know, we, we have to accept it and take care of the girls and just have your way. The helicopter flew Caroline to Batson Children's Hospital at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. She had five skull fractures, bleeding in the brain and brainstem, an orbital fracture, a tear in the carotid artery, and a collapsed lung. My husband kind of panicked and he looked at me and he said, I can't lose her. And I said, you know what? She is not yours. She is not mine and she is not theirs. I said, she belongs to one person and I don't believe he's through with her. But if he is, then that is his to take. I said, but she doesn't belong to us, never did. Caroline survived the night, but she remained in critical condition. They said she could be paralyzed or in a vegetative state for weeks or even years. Leslie and Christopher continued to pray as Caroline had surgery to help stop the swelling around her brain. We had set up a page for her the day after because I couldn't keep up with messaging and texting and keeping everybody up. and. A friend of mine said, what do you want to call this page so you can keep everybody up to date and they can pray? And I said, I'm calling it Caroline's Miracle because that is what she's going to have. She will walk out of this hospital on her own. And I told everybody, every doctor, every nurse, anybody that would listen that walked in there, they looked at me like I was crazy. But I said, she's going to walk out of here on her own. And as time went by, there were people that we found out that were praying in Afghanistan. There were people praying in other countries around the world. 
Caroline was in ICU for 18 days. Her doctor said she would need inpatient rehab for at least 18 weeks. But things did not go as the doctors expected, and Caroline's rehab turned into an amazing recovery. Leslie captured nearly every minute with her cell phone. Opening her eyes for the first time, Caroline's first smile, her first sip of water, standing up for the first time, using a walker for the first time, and walking without her walker. Caroline was in rehab for only six days. Six days. That is, I mean, that's just a miracle. I mean, nobody does that. People that say that the miracle don't happen, I tell them they're a lie because I got one I, I live with. And that's my daughter because God did make sure that she was a miracle. Dr. Edward Manning cared for Caroline after the accident. You usually think about a period of about two years for most of the spontaneous recovery to occur, but she was much beyond that. And she was a very pleasant surprise. Within a couple of days of rehab service, she was talking about wanting to go to church on Sunday. And the doctors agreed that she was able to go home. So she was very happy. I definitely believe in the power of prayer because if it wasn't for him, like hearing people's prayers, I don't think I'd still be here. He will give us his promises, but he don't always put it in our hands. Sometimes we have to go and reach for them. And prayer to me is like reaching for those promises. I know that God still works miracles today because I'm still alive. What an amazing recovery. You know, they're right. Scripture says you have not because you ask not. So we want to contend for you and for your needs in the next few minutes. And Pat, do you want to read yours first? Yeah, Let okay, me. here's one. Her name is Jean or Jeannie from Schenectady, New York. She suffered from a pinched nerve, which also affected her right knee. She couldn't put any pressure on that leg. One day she was watching and Terry, she heard you pray someone you have an issue with your knee, I believe it's your right knee. Uh, just walking is both uncomfortable and so forth. And uh, in Jesus' name, you're healed. By faith, Jean said, that's me. And it wasn't until later she realized that she'd been walking with no pain and could even carry groceries. Wow. Praise right. the Lord. Well, this is Nancy. She lives in Vancouver, Washington. She had been bleeding for two months, and doctors could not find the reason for the severe bleeding. While she was watching this program, Pat, you gave this word of knowledge. Nancy, I believe it is, you've got bleeding ulcers. The Lord has just taken away that pyloric virus, and you are completely healed in Jesus' name. Nancy received the word, knowing it was for her bleeding condition. She was healed that day. She returned to her doctor healed with her numbers completely normal. Praise God. Yeah. Folks, we want to pray for you. You know, there's nothing impossible. Everybody thinks, well, that's medically impossible. How do you reach in and, and, and stop bleeding from a bleeding ulcer? Well, God did it. How does somebody who's got a, a problem in their neck, uh, how does that get fixed? Well, God can do it. Now, Terry and I are going to pray, and we're going to believe God for you. So all I'm asking is that you join with us right now. Mm -hmm. So, Father... I pray with my dear sister in Christ, and the two of us agree together for those in this audience who are suffering. All over America and other parts of the world right now, people are suffering. Mm. And right now, we command a spirit of infirmity to leave people's bodies. In the name of Jesus, that paralysis, that ache, that pain will leave your body right now in the name of mm. Jesus. Yeah. And you are made completely whole, Thank you. Terry. Yes, that ear infection that has not responded to medication. Today's your day. Just touch your ear right now and lift your hands and thank the Lord. He is healing you. And Allison, whatever it is you're praying for, God is already bringing your answer. Uh, Tom, I believe it is. You, you've got swollen gums and bleeding gums. And God right now is reaching out and, and, and really cleaning the roof of your teeth. It's an amazing procedure. It's like the Lord's doing dental work on you, and those teeth are going to be set in as they should be. The swelling and bleeding is gone. Just touch your mouth right now, or your jaw, in the name of Jesus. And someone else, you've Thank had you. a fall that seriously injured your elbow. I believe it's on your right side. Um, and God is just putting that all back into place again. You're going to have full mobility. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
and wherever you are, please call us and let us know what's happened. It's 1-800-700-7000. It's not hard. It's a toll-free number. If you want further prayer, we're here for you. But uh, if you've had an answer, we'd love to hear about it. Terry has more. Well, still ahead, who's taking care of the caregiver? That's the question raised by author, radio host, and caregiver, Peter Rosenberger. He joins us live, and that's later on today's 700 Club. Welcome to Washington for CBN Newsbreak. A coalition of ministries is joining forces for a prayer movement at nearly 5,000 college campuses today. InterVarsity Christian Fellowship is heading up the effort called Collegiate Day of Prayer. The organization says the day is set aside to ask God to pour out His Spirit on colleges and seminaries across the country. Collegiate Day of Prayer has been happening on college campuses since 1823. The fifth annual All Africa Conference recently took place in Rwanda. Established by Saddleback Church, led by Pastor Rick Warren, the conference continues an effort that began 15 years ago. That's when Rwanda became a nation of peace, modeling Warren's peace plan. Leaders from 12 American churches and 19 African nations, plus Costa Rica and Brazil, partnered to bring tools and training for church, health, and community transformation. 25 more nations are set to launch by the end of 2019. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Ninety doctors, 80 operations, and $10 million in medical bills. That's what Peter Rosenberg's wife has endured for over 30 years. And through it all, Peter has been her caregiver. Millions of Americans care for aged or chronically ill family members. These caregivers spend more than 20 hours a week helping their loved ones. But who's taking care of the caregiver? Peter Rosenberger is an author and radio host, and he's been assisting his wife, Gracie, for more than 30 years. In his book, Seven Caregiver Landmines, Peter shares the caregiver's side of the journey and offers tips for families to live healthier, calmer, and more joyful lives. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Peter Rosenberger. It's great to see you. It's, it's been a long time. It has been. You know, Peter and I met years ago on another CBN program, and at that time your wife was with you. But today we're going to talk about some of the landmines that impact caregivers of people who have chronic situations. Tell us what Gracie's scenario is. Well, she had a terrible wreck a long time ago, 35 years ago. Before you ever met before her. Before I met her. She'd had about 20 surgeries by the time I met her. Wow. And uh, But she had not lost her legs yet. And um, that came much later. And the surgery just kept mounting and growing. And, and as you can see, she's you know, she's a babe. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, hey, baby. Um, but she is. Uh, uh, she lives with a, a lot of pain. Yes. Uh, at one time, uh, one of the residents told her prosthetist later that he had counted. He stopped counting at 200 breaks. Wow. And so, when you have that level of trauma, uh, it, it's not a one and done kind of. Th there's always something that evolves yeah. along the journey, and then. Uh, but if you notice that I'm the one that has white hair, and and she does, she people say, well, it's, it's so nice that you hang out with your father, and I'm like, really? Yeah. But but she is, um, uh, she lives with a lot of pain. She's got a, I mean, you've met her. She's got a great spunky attitude. Oh, she does. Thank you. However, yeah. she is not. Um, uh, every day is a challenge for her. Yeah, she's not immune to all the things that no. befall those who are in such chronic situations. Talk about what happened three years into your marriage, because I know you knew she had the accident and she'd had some surgeries, but you had no idea. Oh, no. It, it just kept uh, declining and spiraling, and it was just surgery after surgery. And I uh, I found myself really faltering and, and going. Yeah. I, I, I was a believer going into this, yeah. but I really wasn't. If in, in, And I don't mean that in not saved. It's just that. Uh, Not God, where are you? Yes, this? Exactly. You know, and and I I went into a dark place for a long time, and I, I tell people I'm the crash test dummy of caregivers. If you could fail at it, I fail. I have forgotten more mistakes than most people will ever make, and and caregivers are notorious for beating themselves up for their job performance, and I say, well, you know, look, if you're going to judge yourself by your job performance, 
be fair. Let's ju judge ourselves also by our job attendance record, mm -hmm. which is flawless. Wow, yes. We keep showing up, yeah. however bloody we are, or swearing under our breath or anything else. And so I was, I, I saw myself faltering and nobody really knew what to say to me. And we, we look like we got it all together. We're high functioning multitaskers. Mm -hmm. and, and yet we're not, we're, yeah. we're inwardly, we're, we're crashing. Yeah. And so what I've done over the years is compile a list of things I wish somebody had told me when I was a young man, say, son, here's what's coming down the pike. Here's how we're gonna help you. Here's how we're gonna back you away from this cliff. And here's what you need to watch for. Talk a little bit about what you put in the book. It's called Seven Caregiver Landmines. And there are landmines along they, the way. Well, one of the biggest ones is the isolation that we go through as caregivers. And as I often say, we, we can be isolated in a crowded room. Mm -hmm. We can be isolated on a crowded pew. Yeah. And churches don't really know what to say to folks. In fact, I think this is the first concerted effort of aggressively going after caregivers that we've even done on this show. Mm -hmm. And, and for that, I'm incredibly grateful because these people get overlooked. Yeah. There are a lot of people right now taking care of an aging parent or a loved one or a special needs child. Yes. And they're in the room and all of a sudden the show comes on today and we're talking about the caregiver. So I know that person's laying in the bed that's dealing with all these realities, but right now I'm gonna focus on yeah. the person that's doing this. Let's let them know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. And the valley of the shadow of death is a long valley sometimes. Mm, yeah. How do we know that he's with us? What does that look like? What does it look like for the body of Christ to come together and minister to each other? Then we have that loss of identity. Mm -hmm. Ask a caregiver, how are you doing? Well, I just got, uh, she just got home from the hospital or- It's all about- uh, Or he's not having a good day or we, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, no, no, let's talk about you. And that's when the tears well, you come. you actually said in the book that hardly anybody ever asks you how you're doing. Most of them want to know how Gracie's doing. They, they do. Which and is the logical question, but it, still. It, it is the conventional question. The conventional and, question. And you were so gracious. When, you, when I first walked in here, you said, how are you doing? And, and I was so grateful for that. <laughs> I read the book. You know, well, thank you very much. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, um, caregivers get lost in someone else's yeah. story. Mm -hmm. Well, we're so busy, as I, as I said in the 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 social media interview I did earlier with you guys, we're so busy sometimes tearing up a roof to lower somebody to Jesus that we don't realize how much we need to get down there ourselves. Yes, and we all need to get we down do. there at some point. Sometimes we need somebody to help us get down there. Every right? caregiver needs somebody yeah. to help them back away from this cliff of losing themselves yeah. and, and recognizing that I need him too. Peter, do you think that sometimes because of the seriousness of the person who's contending with whatever the issues are, that the caregiver almost feels guilty they acknowledging? That's, that's one of the landmines yeah. is the guilt. But you know, if I get a splinter in my foot, uh, I need to get I need to get that treated. Before it gets infected. But, but why right. should I? My wife doesn't have any feet. How can I call, talk? Because these are the only feet she can count on. Mm -hmm. And so I need to take care of them. And that's the concept I'm trying to get across to caregivers. You're not doing them a favor by stuffing your own resentment, your own rage, your own physical issues, your own spiritual issues, your own moral issues. Yeah. You're not doing a favor by this, yeah. okay? It's, that's not the way it works. So what do you do? If you find yourself, many of these situations are chronic and long-term. What do you do to be restored? Well, there's several things you can do. One of them is you start with seeing your own doctor. Yeah. Go to your doctor. 72% of caregivers don't even see their own doctor regularly. How's that a good thing? Mm -hmm. So if you want to minister to caregivers, say, hey, when's the last time you saw your doctor? Because your doctor then can give you a, a referral to a, a, a trained counselor. There are support groups out there that, to go to. Churches then can un, also speak into that and say, you know what, can we sit with them while you go to your doctor? Amen. Don't say, let me know if there's something I can do. Yeah. Now I got to think of something for you to do. Yeah. and hope you'll do it and hope you'll do it well. And feel awkward asking. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm at the grocery store. You need some milk? I, can I get your gutters clean? Yes. You know, those are the kind of things that we can start doing for each other. If we don't speak life to each other in this, who's a caregiver gonna listen to? Yeah. The governor of Virginia? Yeah. I mean, how many people are, I, mean, I, just, I just went from preaching to meddling, didn't I? <laughs> but how many people are taking care of a special needs child and are at the brink and Many. then they want to have a discussion now, like the governor of Virginia talked about, or Hawaii just passed our Choice, Our Care Act, say that we can have medically assisted death. But now this guy up in Montreal just smothered his wife with a pillow and he's going to be sentenced next week yeah. because 
It's, medically it assisted. No I mean, we're, if, if, they're not, if we're not speaking life to these people, who are they going to listen to? Well, I just want to say that I know that there are many, many caregivers that are watching the program today and many beyond. If you are one of them or you know someone who is, this book is a must. It's called Seven Caregiver Landmines. It's available wherever books are sold. And you can also hear more of Peter's story on our Facebook page. He mentioned that. Here's how you get there. Just go to facebook.com slash 700 club. He has so much more to share. Wonderful to see you again. Thank you, Terry. You're surviving. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, still ahead, we've got your email. A viewer asks, do you really think that God wants us to go to war with Venezuela? Well, your questions and some honest answers, it's all coming up. When Hurricane Florence hit her hometown, Glenda Holmes says the damage was devastating. People didn't know where to turn for help. But Glenda knew exactly who to call. Glenda and Donnie Holmes are longtime supporters of CBN and Operation Blessing. After years of giving, they never imagined one day they'd reach out to Operation Blessing for help. Then Hurricane Florence hit. It was devastating. People couldn't get what they needed, and they had nowhere to turn to. That's when Glenda put in a call to CBN. I'd been a longtime contributor, and I've never asked for anything. This is a rural community, and a lot of people hadn't recovered from the previous hurricane. But these people need it. They really, really need help. And I wanted to do anything I could to help them. Operation Blessing immediately sent truckloads of food and emergency supplies to Gateway Community Church. The community needed baby supplies and diapers and really needed cleaning supplies because the people who could get back in their houses, there were no cleaning supplies to go in and to even start to rebuild. And that's what you guys sent, and they were very appreciative. Glenda knew she could count on CBN at Operation Blessing. It was nice to know that where I tithe my money to would be there when I needed them. And it made me feel good about continuing to support them. I called for help and they sent exactly what we asked for and it felt really good that I was a small part of that. I want to thank the 700 Club and Gordon and Pat and Operation Blessing. Thank you so much for coming and helping out the community and I will continue to support Operation Blessing as much as I can. And we're really, really grateful and I know that the people in the Pender County are grateful as well. We're often the first in and we're often the last to leave. We believe in helping people. And Operation Blessing is one area that happens where people who are suffering are touched in accordance with the book of Isaiah. If you see the hungry, if you, clothe, you feed him, you see the naked, you clothe them. You see the homeless, you bring them into the home. And God says, I'm going to bless you beyond measure. So look, I want to give you something, the I wills of God. I, 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 if you read the 91st Psalm, you'll find a time which says, because he set his love upon me, here's what I'm going to do. I will, I will, I will, I will. And the, the I wills of God. I'm showing some people who've had dramatic healings, wonderful miracles, answers to prayer, and overcoming fear. We'll give this to you free when you join the 700 Club. And what does it take? It's so easy. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, and you could be a 700 Club member. And we welcome you to a family of thousands. So pick up the phone, call in. It's a toll-free number and say, look, you can count on me. I want to help people in my community. I want to help people around the world. And through what you're doing, we can do just that. So now we've got some questions. We do indeed. This Let's is a viewer who says, do you really think that God wants us to go to war with Venezuela? You don't speak for all Christians and killing other people won't solve this problem. Uh, do you think if there's a rapist running loose in your community who rapes and kidnaps little children, you think we should have police? Do you think the police ought to be armed and if they have to shoot those people? Or we just let them go free. You know, that, that was in a, a, a political campaign uh, when uh, I think Michael Dukakis was asked, well, if somebody's raping your sister, what would you do? Would you go in there and, and try to do something? 
The Bible says the people who are in the armed forces are ministers of God to bring vengeance on the malefactors, on the kidnappers, on the rapists. Now, that, there's a country that's under the control of a vicious dictator. How did those dictators get there? They got there through force of arms. They overthrew the established order and took over, and then Maduro is a successor to that regime. The people by the millions are suffering. Don't you think somebody should go in there and help them? Well, I certainly do. I certainly do. Do I think we ought to go to war? I'd rather not. What I suggested the other day is mass the forces we've got outside. Show those helicopter gunships. Just turn loose a few of those Hellfire missiles and let them hit some targets just inside Venezuela and let those troops know what's going to come. And I think they'll surrender. And that's what you, you need to do. Overwhelming force. But do, do I think we should go to, quote, war with Venezuela? I think we should get a multinational armed uh, contingent to take the force that's needed to set those people free, just like in your city you'd want police to set a uh, rape victim free or a kidnapped, kidnapped soul free. All right. Okay, this is from Victoria, who says, what are your opinions on tattoos? Uh, it's not my opinions what the Bible says. You know, it's, 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 uh, you should not have markings on your body, especially the priests couldn't do that. Anybody, it was, it was a sin. And I, I think God's, our bodies, the temples, the Holy Spirit, and this is a heathen practice, tattoos. I mean, they, they, they did tattoos, and it was a symbol of uh, uh, well, various types of uh, heathen practices. I, I think it's a mistake, and, and I know that people think, oh, well, look, on my tats, aren't they beautiful? I think they're hideous. Okay. Okay, that's his opinion. All right. <laughs> there you go. Okay, this is Cindy, who says, several of my friends take yoga classes to help them relax and keep in shape. I've hesitated to join a yoga class because I've learned that it is based on Hinduism, and the yoga poses are actually bows to the Hindu gods. Is this true? I really need to start an exercise program, but do not get, want to get involved with Hinduism. You've hit it right on the money. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of yoga that has to do with stretching. There's nothing wrong with stretching. There's nothing wrong with being uh, limber. But you know, a guy that they brought to me, his name was Master Adam or something, and he came with all that paraphernalia. And I thought, you know, I don't need this. This guy had unbelievable strength. He could do stuff you wouldn't believe. But, 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 I didn't want to take on those practices. and. Yes, you have a mantra. You're you're speaking. You know, you're speaking this mantra, and and you're calling on Hindu gods. You, you don't understand what you're saying, but they're doing that. And we don't want to get into something like that. Stretching is cool. It's good for you. You stretch before you exercise. You get yourself warmed up, and then you do some stretching. Nothing wrong with that. All right. Okay, this is Eli who says, my wife left our marriage over five years ago. She has a man she calls her husband now. She said she's never coming back. I pray for her and have forgiven her. What is my biblical path here? Well, your biblical path is, brother, you are free. <laughs> Get yourself free. She has gone. That is a, a scriptural ground for divorce. I think that you, if you haven't divorced her, you certainly should. So it's, you know, I think this is where Christians struggle, Pat. Is it okay in a situation where there is biblical ground for yeah. it to be the one to file for the divorce? Well, I course. think people hurt I mean, doing that. Well, why not? I mean, you've got to, you've got to, uh, I mean, she's already severed the relationship. She's, she's taken gone. up with another man and says he's your, her husband. For heaven's sakes, well, why not? But you have all the grounds in the world. I mean, it's desertion. I mean, you can get a quick decree, but I, there's nothing wrong with that as a Christian, all right? Okay, this is Catherine who says, Dear Pat, can you explain God's sovereignty and what good prayer does in relation to the same? Well, can I? I, I can take you through a, a seminary course of a few sem, you know, semesters. Give us the overview. Yeah. <laughs> well, God's sovereignty is He's in charge of everything. And do we think he controls everything? This is the tension that we need to have. And I, 
you know, it's on the one hand, it's man's free will. We have free will. You know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's in charge of everything, and yet at the same time, we're working as, as people who have their own sense of free will. And regrettably, that's all the time we've got. If I ever start a theological school, which I have, you can be a student, and we'd love to have you in our school of divinity. <laughs> well, today's power minute is from the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Thanks for being with us. Join in tomorrow.